So welcome to a brand new season of The Full Moon Show. My name is James Stevenson, the Senior Community Manager at Insomniac Games. And with this season of The Full Moon Show, we wanted to bring you uh, something new. Uh, One of the biggest challenges for The Full Moon Show this year is that we don't really have a lot to talk about project-wise. But we did want to still bring you some brand new and exciting stories from Insomniac, stories from our development and insight into the studio. So for the next few months of episodes, you're going to be hearing directly from some of the people involved with uh, your favorite projects and some projects you never uh, saw or know about. And this week will be a big example of that. We're going to be talking to a group of folks about I-5, or as some of you know it, Girl with a Stick. Now, to many of you, this may remind you of the Resistance to Beta, which we jokingly titled Girl with a Stick, but... It was actually Insomniac's fifth game and first attempt at a new IP after Spyro the Dragon. Uh, We sit down with a group of folks who was at Insomniac at the time nine years ago when we first tried to develop this IP and eventually canceled it. So with that, we're going to go into the interview. And you may have seen some of this last week along with the video footage and pieces of the interview. This is the unabridged interview, uh, and you can hear all of it here on the Full Moon Show. So I thought the uh, inspiration for I-5 was kind of um, Tomb Raider meets Zelda. Like, those were the two things that... Brian Algeyer, creative director. Actually, no, it was earlier than that. It started out as an, a young African boy. It was Al's idea. It was Al's Isaac's. idea, yeah. that's right, with magic. And it was, it was. I remember it wasn't... Yeah, we had a lot of ideas, actually. We, were, yeah. we would brainstorm for several days. Remember, I, Ted Price. Founder and CEO. Was that the time we got everybody up on the roof when we were having barbecue and beer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. We had multiple like round tables where everyone would get together and pitch. Brian Hastings, chief creative officer. And I think uh, it, it was Al's idea because he, he he'd put the most I think effort and research into. He'd research all the stuff from mythological Africa or in Africa, and he, he blended it with uh, African mythology, and he came up with this this big thing. And it just it just I guess seemed so so compelling, and you know, so fully fleshed out. Why did we change? Was that, was that my fault? Or? <laughs> was, uh, we, we, well, we moved him out of Africa to Peru. John Fiorito, chief operating officer. Right. It I became think we had some hesitations about, became, you know, we're, we're basically a lot of white guys making yeah. a game about a black and it's this, it's this sort of dishonest or, like, I don't know. Yeah, we'd be very self-conscious about yeah. that. But to keep it, I think to keep it non-standard, we went with a female protagonist. That was the idea. Okay, so we can't do an African-American or African kid, but we can do... A female lead, and which was for us really pushing it after Purple Dragons, I guess. Insomniac, ten years ago. Yeah, ten, ten, year, ten years ago, I remember Insomniac. We were in one big room. Um, <laughs> we two. Were, no, we two. had two because yes, there was we a two. room on the outside of the building as well. This is on Universal lot, right? Yeah. No, no, this was on Barham. Barham Boulevard. Oh, okay. Right. Okay, I was right. Right. Exactly. We were kind of in transition right around yeah. there because we just finished Spyro and we knew because uh, Universal owned the rights, we couldn't go on with Spyro anymore. We had to do our own thing. So we were, you know, we, we had to come up with the next big thing that would mean the, you know, survival of the company. So it was, it was a big moment for us, a turning point. Yeah, yeah, I think no. we were all looking for something different because we've been working on Spyro for yeah. years and we just didn't, we were thinking we got to branch out. We didn't out want to do bit. too cute anymore. Yeah. And and we didn't know what the, the PlayStation Two was, so we we thought it was going to be big and serious, and uh, you could do anything. So I think we came up with a really big, serious game where we tried to do anything. Yeah, I, I remember someone just saying that we could draw endless numbers of polygons. Oh, yeah. There was no <laughs> limit. One billion what we characters do. on screen. Right. Yeah, I remember doing a test building a, a meadow, and we built each blade of grass, and each blade of grass was hundreds and hundreds of polygons, and. We got about a square foot of grass until the game crashed. I remember I started working on it about six to eight months before Spyro finished because I think we really realized we had to get a head start because everyone would be finishing Spyro, rolling off, and then doing what? And there was a lot of pressure because it took the entire studio just to finish a game. I mean, it's still it still does. <laughs> but then we knew we had to start the new game, so that was a really – challenging time for me at least Um, it was well i mean going from a several years where we had just been making sequels to a brand new ip on a new platform was the big challenge especially since we'd made the decision to try to move away from platformers i mean it was a lot of things kind of hitting us at once and uh, and that made it exciting and kind of scary at the same time and that was 
part part of the whole challenge was we got so many, I thought, different ideas coming in through the brainstorming sessions. It was really hard to pick one that stood out and was unique. And I think Al's, though, was the most unique at the time. Yeah, I still I still remember to this day he had this idea where the boy, when he closed his eyes, the screen would reflect that, and then you could see the spirit world. And it was a really powerful description. And yeah, the way he described it, it sounded really awesome. Yeah, and... Uh, Gosh, I, I think the closest thing I've seen to that to this day is the auger in Resistance. <laughs> you, know, you, you turn on the, uh, the the scope and you see you see the outlines of characters. Although Prey, Prey had a pretty good good version of that though too. Just to name another game that was had that sort of similar spiritual kind of approach. The beginning of I 5s development. Yeah, I was actually focused on Spyro Three the whole time i remember ted and i think john you guys shifted over to i5 fairly early and every once in a while we'd kind of all get together and brainstorm and like kind of share the ideas and it did transform it was the young african boy it was the um mayan guy it was then later the the girl with the stick and she was a young girl i think at one point she was kind of like this dark haired short like 10 year old girl and then she kind of started to age yeah, she a little became, bit. I think we realized that she was too generic looking, and then we started experimenting with a very tan girl with white hair, with runes and stuff on her arms that would start glowing when she did her katas, and the katas were her way of unlocking the magic. Not unlocking, but casting yeah, spells. They were actually really cool looking. I mean, they, those, were, those were a nice thing. I think that was Al's idea, wasn't it? That, the katas, the runes? or The, the katas, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Toward the end, that was like one of the cool things that uh, just kind of stood out about it. Yeah, it was definitely. What was cool was it was the button presses. So I thought, if I remember right, we were doing some pretty complicated animations, and you would trigger them with button presses. So you had to press the button at the right time, kind of like God of War. Yeah, but earlier, very ahead right. of our time. Yeah, <laughs> very early version of the quick time event. I remember really early in the process when we had just gotten all the drawings together and the pitch to Sony uh, before we had gotten to the stage of actually building stuff. And we were supposed to present at E3 2000 to Akira Sato and all of the other assembled Japanese executives. And that was my job. And so I'd been preparing for this for a long time. And my wife happened to be pregnant at the time. And I said, babe, just deliver. you can deliver any day but this day. And that morning at 5 a.m., she went into labor. And poor Al Hastings was the guy who was, I called at 6 o'clock and said, hey, Al, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it to this presentation. Do you mind doing it? And he hadn't seen any of the materials. And he went in and he presented to Akira Sato. And kudos to him because they signed on and we were able to begin development. Building a PlayStation 2 engine. Well, we had, we started over from scratch yeah. like uh, as soon as we switched projects. So we had very little time. Al pretty much had to rewrite everything from start we he he done actually he'd already done a tremendous job of getting us up and running on the playstation 2 and what we showed you know i look back at those videos and i can't believe how much he was able to do in such a short period of time and it looked good however that was the point where naughty dog came in and said hey you will are you guys want do you guys want to share technology and they uh opened their doors and we were able to have this great exchange which resulted in even bigger environments for ratchet and our ability to do more stuff the decision to cancel the game I, I recall 